What's up guys, welcome to Paul's Hardware. Today's video is a beginner's guide on how to build a computer. I've done these many times in the past, but today's video I think is kind of special because for one, graphics card prices have finally dropped to the point where you can build a pretty solid mid-range gaming computer, which is what we're building today for about $800. Also, this is my build of the month video for July 2018, and every month at the beginning of the month, I do build lists videos. So the first part of building a PC is choosing the parts, and if you're wondering how I chose these parts, check out my July builds video posted earlier this month. Finally, it's my first time building in the Lian Li 011 air chassis, so I'm going to be taking a closer look at that at the same time. Excellent! The Mastercase H500M by Cooler Master sports dual 200mm addressable RGB fans, a USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C port, and four tempered glass side panels, both sides, top, and front. And the front can swap out for a mesh panel if you want maximum airflow. It has a plethora of cable routing covers to keep things tidy too, so click the sponsor link in the description to learn more. So what are the highlights of this $800 PC? Well, first you have an R5 1600 CPU, which is a six core 12 thread processor from AMD. This is a very solid processor for both gaming as well as doing some media creation as well as possibly gaming and streaming at the same time, if that's something you're interested in. We've also got a very solid mid-range graphics card in the RX 580 with eight gigabytes of video memory. And a bonus here is that you, if you decide to upgrade to a gaming monitor, it is free sync compatible and those tend to be a little bit less expensive. Other than that, we've got eight gigabytes of DDR4 memory, a 240 gig SSD to load our operating system onto, as well as a nice feature set on our motherboard. I'm gonna go over each part individually really quick to talk about not just the part itself that I'm building with today, but sort of the range of parts that you might choose for each component that you're choosing, because that's one of the benefits of building your own computer is choosing the parts yourself. Also building it yourself will allow you to go in in the future to do upgrades or repairs if needs be. Now, a cool thing about this build is that uh, since two or three weeks ago when I put all the parts together in the list, it has actually dropped in price by about $50 thanks to selling the motherboard as well as the uh, SSD going down in price. Now, I've taken that $50 extra dollars and I've applied it to the case. Uh, the Lian Li 011 Air costs more in the $120 to $140 range depending where you buy it. And that is probably not the best bet because if you have extra unexpected money to spend on your computer, you're probably going to want to apply it somewhere where you get a little bit more performance. So let me talk about about the prices of each of our components and where you might more intelligently spend your extra $50 to get more performance, starting with the CPU. And the CPU is often a place where you might start when you're building a computer, choose your CPU and then work from there. The Ryzen 5 1600 is a great choice right now because you can get it for about $150, six cores and 12 threads. It's a very good performer and you get a lot of bang for your buck. It's also on a platform, which is Socket AM4, uh, which has quite a few different motherboard chipsets available for it. But uh, Socket AM4 is compatible with a lot of different AMD CPUs including second generation Ryzen processors, the 2000 series CPUs such as the 2600 and 2700X. That said, if you're gonna upgrade the 1600 to something else, I would recommend the 1700, even though it is still also first gen Ryzen, you get eight cores and 16 threads, and that is a big bump without spending too much extra cash. For me, next on the list for potential upgrades would probably be the SSD or the memory. We have an eight gig memory kit here, which will get us by, but 16 gigs is a lot nicer. We're gonna pay about $100 for a eight gig DDR4 kit that's about DDR4 3000 speed, and we do want faster DDR4 3000 or so speed memory for our Ryzen platform because it does benefit a lot from faster memory. You also wanna make sure that your memory is compatible and will work. So I specifically went into the memory compatibility list for this motherboard in order to make sure that the kit I chose will work out of the box, which is the case for the uh, G-Skill Riptos 4 kit that I've chosen. If you do have a bit of extra cash though, you can for about 60 or $70 more, get a 16 gig memory kit for the $160, $170 range. Just again, double check that kit that you choose, make sure it will work with your X370 or X470 or B350 or B450 motherboard that you have chosen. And again, make sure to get memory that's pretty decently fast. I would recommend 3000 speed or faster. Now I always recommend SSDs for your operating system drive at least, and 240 gigs will get you by. This SSD is actually only about $54 right now. Um, but if you've got, again, extra 40, 50 bucks to spend, you can get a 480 gig SSD, and that will get you just a lot more base system storage space, especially for loading up games and that kind of thing. It is nice to have more storage space, but if you can't afford that, or if you just wanna to stick to the budget, just remember to grab another hard drive. So for 40 or 50 bucks, you should be able to get yourself a one terabyte hard drive, or 
or do what I recommend and find an old computer somewhere that you can steal the hard drive from, format it, and then use it as a storage drive in your new system. Now the graphics card could be upgraded as well, but this is about a $250 graphics card. Also consider the GTX 1060 6 gig. That's another good option in this range. But to level up from here, you're probably gonna need to spend about $400. So for that reason, I would say don't consider that for now. But yes, this system could handle a higher end graphics card in the future. The case again, you're probably gonna wanna stick to about a 60 or $70 range for, and here there are just so many options. The H500 from NZXT, uh, the P400 from Fantex that I originally recommended. There's others as well. So just choose a case that has good reviews, decent airflow, and that matches your aesthetic tastes. Finally, for the power supply, my requirements are 550 to 650 watts, 80 plus bronze rated or better. And then a final bonus is if you can find one that has all black cables like this one here. Uh, the Corsair power supply that's recommended in the parts list will actually be available for $40 to $50. This one will cost you a little bit more, but it also has the bonus of being 80 plus gold rated, which will give us a little bit more efficiency, and it's fully modular, so we have plugs for all the cables. We only need to use the ones that we're actually gonna use. So if all goes well today, the only tools I'll really need are a Phillips head screwdriver, and um, I like have to have something to cut with. But let's talk a little bit about our motherboard choice before we move on. This is an X370 motherboard. That refers to the chipset. And then the socket, which is right here, that's where the CPU actually goes, is AM4. The socket is gonna be very important for the motherboard that you choose. You're gonna make sure that the motherboard and the socket are compatible with your processor. And then beyond that, there's some other features I would look for. Now, the reason I chose X370 for this and you can go x370 or x470 that 470s are a little bit newer uh, i would also potentially have you guys look at b350 and b450 motherboards the b450s are going to be the newest the x series boards though tend to, to cost a little bit more but they also tend to be built a little bit better this board is on sale right now though for a uh, hundred dollars and even with a twenty dollar mail-in rebate after that so that's part of the thing helping keep the cost down but by going with a slightly higher end motherboard you might get better power delivery over here so that might allow you to overclock the cpu if that's something you're interested in and all these Ryzen CPUs are unlocked for overclocking. The other features I looked for were making sure it had four DIMM slots here so we can upgrade our memory in the future. I like that this motherboard has Wi-Fi integrated, 802.11ac Wi-Fi, so it comes with a couple antenna right here that you can connect to the Wi-Fi that's integrated onto the back. And finally, we've got a couple of these M.2 slots. And M.2 slots, at least these particular ones, are made for uh, newer types of storage drives, like this little M.2 NVMe drive right here. You don't need drives that are this fast for a gaming system, but it's nice to be able to upgrade to them in the future. And having two of those just gives you, again, more expandability for the future. This is an M.2 slot up here as well, but it's a different type of M.2 and it's made just for Wi-Fi cards. That was all a pretty decent amount of exposition, but we're actually gonna start building right now just to be safe and to test some parts before we put everything together. We're gonna do what's called an outside of the box build. So for that, I have our motherboard out. Some other motherboard accessories you wanna grab just to have them out right now are gonna be your IO shield right there. I got a couple SATA cables so we can connect our storage drives in a minute. Uh, also got the Wi-Fi antenna. We don't really need this stuff right now, but I have it out. Motherboard manual is gonna be key to help figure out a few things. And then the parts I'm interested in testing right now are gonna be the memory, the motherboard, of course. Uh, we're gonna test out the graphics card, and then we've got the power supply and our processor. So another way we're saving a little bit of money on this build is going with the stock heatsink fan for the processor. The 1600 will come with a Wraith Spire, uh, which is a perfectly decent little cooler. Yes, this can be upgraded as well in the future, but uh, for now, we'll get the job done. This has four mounting points on the bottom, and we'll usually have some pre-applied thermal paste. This one has been used before, so I'm gonna be applying my own thermal paste, but check that out and see if you've got some pre-applied there, in which case just don't touch it or anything, leave it in place, and then you won't need to apply your own. The CPU itself will come in its own protective clamshell. This is actually a 1600X CPU, but uh, effectively exactly the same for our installation processes here. And then we're actually also going to need to do a little bit of preparation on the motherboard, because AM4 motherboards come with a plastic bracket right here, and there are some coolers that latch down to this bracket via these two attachment points on the outside, but the stock heatsink fan actually doesn't use that. We need to remove Move this bracket first. I should have mentioned this already, but static electricity is something that you should at least pay some attention to when you're working with computer parts like this. If you are concerned about ESD, electrostatic discharge, then you're gonna to wanna to take your power supply, plug it into a grounded outlet. You don't need to turn the power supply on, then just touch the housing, and that will make sure that you are electrostatically discharged, and then you can continue to work on your sensitive electronic components. 
when I removed those two brackets, the back plates came loose. This motherboard does have a back plate on the back, which sits in there just like that. So just bear in mind as we're setting our motherboard down on our non-conductive cardboard box here that it came in to keep that kind of in place. And then we can go ahead and install our CPU. So now we're gonna install our CPU. So we're gonna open the clamshell. Be careful in this part because the CPUs do have pins on the bottom and those pins can be bent and you definitely do not want to do that. So hold the CPU by the edges and then note, if you look at it from the bottom or the top, there should be one corner that has a triangle on it. So note that triangle and then look at the socket itself. There should be a small, little, little tiny triangle on the corner of that socket as well. Now we're going to lift up this little retention arm on the side of the socket and that will open it up, line up the triangle and simply drop the CPU down into the socket. Should require no pressure. Zero insertion force required to install that CPU, just like these mugs that I sell with the zero insertion force screw on it. You guys should all buy one of those, available on my store at paulshardware.net. But anyway, uh, once, that's, <laughs> once you've double checked that the CPU is all the way down in the socket, all you gotta do is lower that retention arm and it is installed. Now we're gonna install the CPU cooler. Again, you'll usually have some pre-applied single-use thermal paste on there if it's a brand new CPU. We do not have that, so we're gonna apply our own thermal paste with just a blob right here in the center. If you have old thermal paste that you need to clean for some reason, you can use some paper towels and some rubbing alcohol. For our purposes though, we've got a little blob in the center. I usually go smaller than a pea, but larger than a grain of rice. Uh, and then we're gonna set our CPU cooler directly on top of that, lining up four screws. And now we're gonna tighten the four screws, but don't just tighten one corner all the way down. I usually like to get it just threaded on there. Then go across to the opposite corner. We'll do the same there with just a turn or two. And we'll get corner number three threaded. And corner number four is threaded on there. And then we can go ahead and tighten down the other corners. And there we go, it should be nice and secure on there. Our CPU cooler is installed. Now there should be a plug coming off of it. This is a fan plug four pin, and there should be a four pin header on the motherboard that says CPU fan. If you can't find the CPU fan header on your motherboard, it's a good time to double check the manual, which should have a layout of where those all are. And for pretty much any plug that you're plugging into while installing a computer, there's only one way to plug it in. So there is a key on one side of this. Just make sure you line that up. Next, we're gonna install the memory. We have two sticks and we have four slots. So again, you should double check your manual to make sure which slots you should install to because you do want these in dual channel mode. Usually it's gonna be every other slots and usually it will be the further two slots from the uh, actual CPU that they want you to start with. So we're gonna go with slot number two, slot number four here. There's clasps on either side sometimes but this uh, motherboard design actually only has clasps on one side and then the memory itself has a notch in the middle. It's not quite in the middle, it's slightly offset. Uh, so you'll notice the notch here is on this side. So we're gonna flip the memory over, line up the two sides with the slots and then give it firm pressure straight down and you should get a little snap in on the side that lets you know it's installed. It's usually a very satisfying feeling. Uh, memory is also very easy to remove and that's why memory is an easy thing to upgrade because all you have to do is loosen that little slot, lift it out and there you go. So memory installation, memory removal, one of the easier things to upgrade in a DIY PC. So just a couple more things to do for our outside of the box test setup. We need power to the motherboard and there are two main power connectors from the power supply to the motherboard. There's an eight pin. This is the supplemental CPU power, which is up here in the top left on the board. And then there's the main 24 pin power connector. Both of these have little catches on uh, one side of them. So you can only plug that plug in one way. And the main thing to keep an eye out for when it comes to power supply plugs are the CPU supplemental plug, which is a block of eight, four plus four like that. And then the, uh, graphics card supplemental power, which is also a block of eight, but it's gonna be a six plus two like that. Again, these are also keyed in there, so it's very challenging to actually plug a PCI Express graphics plug into the CPU one on the motherboard, but it is important to know that both exist because uh, that is one of the things that you might get confused about. So that should pop in and clasp itself pretty easily, and then we will bring 24 pin around here for the main and plug that in like so. Now bear in mind for these 24 pins, they can be pretty sticky sometimes. So you might want to give the motherboard a little bit of support underneath it. And if you do need to unplug it, just keep the clasp loosened and you can kind of rock it back and forth and you should eventually be able to get it to come loose. 
Last part to plug in is gonna be the graphics card and that goes in the top full length PCI Express slot right here. This is a by 16 slot and ASRock has reinforced it with some steel there to make it look flashier and maybe even more sturdy, who knows. There's a long PCI Express graphics plug on one side of the graphics card and it should be able to drop in just like this. When we install in a case, there's gonna be some connections over here that hold this a lot more securely. So for now, just keep an eye on it. It will be a little bit wobbly. But the last thing we need to plug in for power is gonna be our GPU supplemental power from the power supply, which plugs in just like the other plugs did. We're now ready for our first initial test boot, and this is gonna be encounter one of two with the front panel connectors on the motherboard, which are some little pinouts, which are kind of annoying to get at, but you're gonna to wanna to find the ones that say power button, and you're gonna bridge a connection between them with just a piece of metal or a flathead screwdriver for just a second. Oh, actually, before you do that, you should uh, plug in and turn on your power supply. Then you can bridge that connection for just a second, and the computer should turn on. I've pulled out a dusty monitor here and connected it up just so we can see some stuff on screen, hopefully, and uh, prove that our graphics card is working. But initial signs of success are gonna be fan spinning on the uh, CPU cooler, as well as the graphics card, as well as lights generally lighting up on the motherboard. And there we have it. We have successfully booted into the BIOS or the UEFI as it's also known. And we can see a quick listing of the components that we have installed. Now I don't have a keyboard or anything attached here. If you wanted at this point, you could go ahead and plug in drives and start loading windows and everything. But for our all intents and purposes, we have working hardware here and we can go ahead and install it in the case. Oh, and people always ask me how to turn off the outside of the box build. Just uh, the same way you turned it on, hit that power button one more time. If it doesn't turn off immediately, Hold it on for about eight seconds. So here's our case, the Lian Li PC-011 Air. This is a pretty new case, um, but the original version of it, the O11 Dynamic, was very popular and well-received and pretty well-designed. But whether you got this case or a different case, all standard tower-style ATX cases are gonna have some similarities. Usually you're gonna have some intakes, some fan intakes in the front. You usually have some exhaust, usually at the top in the back or the top of the case in general. This case is somewhat unique in that it also has some exhaust straight back that direction, uh, which not all cases have, but that just gives you some other airflow and liquid cooling options. And then the super popular thing these days is to have a tempered glass side panel so you can see in at your system once you've actually put it together. This tempered glass has some plastic sheeting on it, so I'm going to leave that on. While we do our build, we'll peel it off at the very end so we keep that protected while we do that. But then finally from the back here, we can see where our motherboard I.O. will be. So our motherboard tray is right in there like that. Our graphics card outputs and it uh, will be right here. And then the power supply will be over on this side. And then most cases also have an area on the left behind the motherboard tray where you can do cable management. One of the nice things about this case is it's a little bit wider. So it gives you a lot more room to do your cable management. So we're moving on to the case, and the first thing you're gonna wanna do with any case is pretty much disassemble it, or at least take off the side panels, maybe the front and uh, top panel as well, just to give yourself a better idea of how it's all put together. This case, for example, has a top panel that actually needs to be removed before your side panels can be removed, which uh, is an interesting design, but I kinda like how the tempered glass sits in there, actually, but not to get too distracted, though, the case is going to have typical mounting locations for most stuff, so motherboard is gonna go on the motherboard tray right in there. Where is the power supply gonna go? Down here in the back at the bottom. Where is the graphics card gonna go? It's gonna sit on top of the motherboard and it's gonna have outputs right here. What else in the case needs to be connected up? It comes with two pre-installed fans at the front here for intakes. That's for the standard Lian Li 011 Air. This is the 011 Air RGB, which means it came with a three pack of three extra RGB fans, which I could install, but I'm not going to because I'm gonna pretend this is the less expensive version. And honestly, two 120 millimeter front intakes fans is good but these fans are going to need some power connection and that's probably going to plug into your motherboard and then the case itself is almost always going to have a collection of cables that come from the front panel area which is to connect up the front panel for USB 3.0 this one actually also has USB 3.1 gen 2 which our motherboard does not have so that connection is just not going to be used and then we've also got HD audio for the front audio jacks as well as those uh, kind of pain in the butt front panel connectors for power reset and LEDs Lastly, you wanna consider where your drives go. So SSD is gonna go in one of these drive trays down in the bottom. Our hard drive actually has a couple options. Uh, this case has a vertical rail here that could mount a couple 3.5 inch drives to it. But actually what I think I'm gonna use is this little tucked away spot in the back, which actually has a couple drive cages that you can mount the drives to, slot them in there, and then you can actually access them from the back. Also tucked in here is our case accessories, which 
you might be interested in as well. Here's the accessories that come in that little box for these screws here with the kind of rougher thread on them. Uh, those are gonna be for the power supply. We'll mount that in just a second. You have these finer thread screws here. These are gonna be for mounting the motherboard to the motherboard standoffs. They've also thrown in a few extra motherboard standoffs there, although most of them are pre-installed. And then we've got these guys, and these guys are actually made specifically for spinning mechanical drives, 3.5 inch drives, because if you have one of the drive trays, it might have little rubber mounts like that. Those just pop right in there and then mount the drive from underneath. I'm gonna get the power supply installed just so I can plug power into everything else as I install it. Uh, other than the three cables coming off of this that we already used in our test setup, I've just plugged in the SATA power for this as well since we have two drives to plug in, each will need a single SATA power plug. The power supply does have a fan intake here so it's gonna wanna draw air in from the side panel so we'll wanna have that facing out. Just drop the power supply in like so. So I think we'll move on to installing the drives next since we have those up and ready to go. Pretty simple to install, just uh, flip the drives over and there's mounting points on the bottom. I did have to switch these little grommets over one notch on this, but uh, the spacer screws line up and screw in just like that. And that gives us a little bit of a, a shock mount on it to help reduce some vibration noise uh, while the drive is spinning. And then the 2.5 inch drive or SSD mounts the same way, just with four screws from the bottom. And uh, both of these have little brackets that will hold them in place and then we can install them. So now they're ready to go in, but each drive is gonna to connect to the power supply for SATA power, and that is via the longer L-shaped plug on the back. And then there's a shorter L-shaped plug, and that is for data that will require a SATA data cable that's gonna plug into the motherboard. To make things easier, I'm just gonna pre-plug these in. So there's my SATA plug for the 3.5 inch drive. All right guys, and our drives are installed. I managed to use just a single SATA power cable from the power supply to go down here to this uh, lower SSD first and then reach up there to the upper hard drive. I probably need an additional cable if I wanted to add more drives to this, but everything is wired up and installed for now. We're now ready to install the motherboard into the case. And before you install any motherboard, uh, you're gonna want an IO shield, which is basically a little panel that goes over the inputs and outputs on the back of the board. It provides some protection uh, for the back of the case, as well as some electrostatic discharge contact points for some of these inputs and outputs. And we always want to make sure this is installed first before installing our motherboard. Just make sure you've got it lined up properly with the inputs and outputs, and you should be able to push it in from the inside of the case. Sometimes they will give you a bit of a hard time, in which case just get the butt of a screwdriver and you should be able to pop it in. And now before we drop our motherboard in, we wanna double check our standoffs. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. That's the standard layout for uh, standard ATX motherboards. So we can drop our motherboard on top of that, give it a little push to the side. Now we can just go ahead and screw in all nine screws. And uh, you don't wanna over tighten these, just get them snug. If you over tighten them, then there's a chance that when you try to remove this motherboard at some point in the future, that will you, you will also unscrew the motherboard standoff beneath it. That's annoying. A quick note here, this motherboard actually has 10 standoffs. There's one extra one right here. That's actually a micro ATX standoff point. I'm not putting a standoff and a screw there. You can if you want to, but it's not really required since we have all nine otherwise. At this point, everything is pretty much installed except for the graphics card, and we're gonna wait and do that last. And I've also gone behind here and done a decent amount of cable management. There is that hard drive bracket back there, and by removing that, I was able to access stuff a little bit more easily and just pushed everything through these grommets here so it would come out in about the location I would need it. So for example, 24 pin main motherboard power connector is right there, so we can plug that in. Eight pin supplemental CPU power connector is over here, so we can plug that back in. These are the same things that we plugged in when we did the outside of the box build. And then I do have a main power plug coming out here for the graphics card, but we're just gonna set that aside for now. Let's move on to the other plugs that I have passed through here. There is a longer USB 3.0 plug here. This motherboard has two headers for that, so it doesn't matter which one we plug into. Also got two fan plugs coming from the two fans at the front of the case. Uh, these are four pin plugs, but fans can be either three or four pin. Uh, we're just gonna plug those into fan headers that we can locate on the motherboard. There's a chassis fan header right there, and then another one over here at the bottom. Next up, we have two SATA data plugs, and these are coming from the SSD at the front and the 3.5 inch mechanical drive at the back. So these are just going to plug into one of our six available SATA ports or SATA headers on the motherboard. And again, here, doesn't matter which of these you plug each drive into. 
And then we've got a couple more front panel headers. This is the HD audio plug. Uh, this is the same exact size as a USB 2.0 plug. Uh, just bear in mind, there are nine out of the eight pins that are actually populated. And the blank pin is different on USB 2 versus HD audio. So it is challenging to get those mixed up, but bear in mind, they are the same size. And last, but certainly the most annoying, are our main front panel connectors. Again, this is so that the power and reset button on the front of the case works, as well as the little lights that blink on. Power and reset, you can plug in either way. It doesn't matter which pin they're plugged into, but the LED does have a plus and a minus. So depending on the motherboard you're using, you might have printed text on the motherboard itself that shows you which pins you should plug into. If you're not sure, definitely double check the manual. And the final piece we will install here is the graphics card for that. Uh, there's some expansion slot covers here at the back. So again, Phillips head screwdriver, and we'll remove the two of these that line up with the PCI Express slot that we're going to be installing the graphics card to. And then for this part, you guys have done this before. So just drop the graphics card straight down into that empty slot, and it should slot into place. That should be a little bit more satisfying this time because you should also be lining up on the back with your rear bracket. Next up, just replacing those two Phillips head screws on the back bracket, and that should make everything feel nice and stable in there. Although this end of the graphics card tends to be a little wobbly. And then lastly, we have PCI Express graphics power connection, and we should have just enough room to plug that in too. Well, all right guys, we are now at the point where you would maybe think about putting like the side panels back on and everything, but no, don't do that quite yet. First, you're gonna wanna find your power cord for your power supply, go ahead and plug that in, go ahead and switch your power supply on, and then hit the power button and now your system should turn on. This is, again, excellent news. Everything's powering on. We got lights, we got spinning fans, front fans are spinning, and everything's looking pretty tidy. Of course, at this point, what do you do next? Very good question, and I have a video specifically on that topic, so I would direct you now to my first five things to do with a new PC build, where I walk you through installing Windows 10, as well as some other stuff. Don't forget to watch the follow-up three more things video as well, because I supplement it, so uh, check both of those videos out if you want to know what to do next. Next. Well guys, the system came together quite nicely and whether you're a first time builder or you've done this a hundred times before, I hope you maybe have learned a little bit of something from watching this video. My final thoughts on the Lian Li 011 Air are that it's a very easy case to build in. I like that there's a lot of space. I like that it's not insanely tall or insanely huge. It's just a little bit wider than normal chassis. I think if it came across a downside, it would probably be a similar complaint to what Gamers Nexus have, which is that the dust filters on the case, although they are everywhere, are not the most ideal. They're held on by magnets and Gamers Nexus also saw that if you remove that front dust filter it actually improves the airflow and the thermal performance of the case quite a bit. But again guys check out that first five things to do with a new PC build if you're wondering what next steps are. Thank you so much for watching this video and we'll see you guys next time.